Welcome to the show, everybody. It is, uh, we are here live. My name is Cam McCarroll, and uh, welcome to another episode of the McCarroll Team Show, where it is our job to share with you the latest news and perspectives the Canadian homeowners and investors need to know, and where you're going to see the best live deals that are currently available both on and off the market. I've got joining me today, uh, we have Adam Cook. Howdy, everybody. Who's currently highlighted during the whole time I'm talking. I don't know, for some reason, they like, the camera likes you. Just kind of zooms over to you. Uh, we've got Adam Cook. We've got uh, Tabitha Thompson. Hello. We have Matt Grenier. Hello, hello. Don't know why the camera doesn't move when Matt talks, but anyway, we got to work on our Zoom cameraman. We got, mm -hmm. Someone's got to wake that cameraman up. And we got Aro Hussein on hey. the call. Hey, guys. What's happening? All right. So, you know, we are the McCarroll team. We are residential sales, investment sales, and generally focused in the Hamilton area. Adam's working his, uh, working his tight muscles out. He's been, he's, you, you can't see me. You shouldn't have pointed that out. It, when it's yeah, not on know, me, no one can I see know, it. Sorry, my back. I'm in a lot of back pain right now. So I'm, I'm that's all I'm saying. All right. I'm a little OCD with my, my commentary <laughs> here. Uh, anyway, so um, we are investment focused uh, real estate team uh with uh we also work with homeowners as well of course in the hamilton general area and so we go through the show uh so what our show is all about is one of the things you're going to learn on the show is we provide information that's not either widely available or it's going to be presented in a way that we're breaking it down for you so you can look at the market from a an educated view like a real estate investor's view on uh the real estate market so this maybe will help you understand how to take advantage of some opportunities that may you may not otherwise see uh, or may not know are available. Uh, that's our goal here is to sort of just educate and provide uh, value. During our live deal section of the show, we're going to go over properties that are live. And these are currently available. Uh, today, I think we've got a, a packed show. we got four properties. The guys have been out there hunting. They've brought home the best of the best uh, investment properties that we're going to show you today. So stick around, make sure you see all four of those. Uh, and we're going to analyze these deals live so that you can see all the numbers. You can see what strategy we're using and what the opportunity and what the expected return of each particular property is. And if you're just learning about real estate investing or, you know, you're a homeowner and you're looking to get into the house hacking world, this is a great way to learn how to analyze properties and get to know the important points to consider before you go shopping. Um, there's a lot going on in the market today. We're going to be discussing, we're going to do an up market update. I think we're going to open it up a little bit just to talk about, um, yeah, kind of the viewpoint going forward. Eh? What's the latest? You know, there's a lot of news going on uh, real estate wise. So we'll just kind of get into some some stuff in the middle. We'll talk to, to go through a couple of live deals. Uh, so why don't we uh, dive right in? Um, one thing before we do get into the show entirely, uh, if you're watching on YouTube or if you're watching live, uh, you can put your comments down below, or put them in the chat. We'll love to hear from you guys. Uh, we love your feedback and questions. If you have certain questions, anything you specifically you want to know about with regards to the market uh, or our opinions, or if you want to share your opinion, uh, we'd love to hear from you guys about what you're thinking in terms of the real estate market. It's a bit of a community we're focused on here. If you're on YouTube, make sure to post your comments and questions down below because we will answer them. And if you could do us a huge solid and like, and subscribe uh, on our YouTube channel. Uh, we are trying to grow it. It's like growing, um, I don't know, it's like growing something in the desert. It's kind of like, it requires continual feeding uh, of water. So we need some subscriptions. We need people to help us get uh, over that 1000 number. YouTube will reward us once we get over that thousand. So if you could just give us a hand, that would be amazing. Go to YouTube, you gotta sign in on your Google account and subscribe, that would be amazing. Anyway, let's get on with the show. Without further ado, as long as I can get my screen over here. Um, oh, I got that screen on. I don't know why that's on. Anyway, McCarroll Team Show, 12, uh, May 12th. Okay, so one thing we got is the buyer list. If you're not on our buyer list, this is the best way to find out what the deals are that we show every week on the show. You're going to get an email with all of the details that we share on the show. So make sure you get on our buyer list. Go to McCarrollTeam.com. Totally free to join, and uh, it's where you're going to get um, access to these deals sent right to your inbox. So uh, you can go through the whole presentation specifically for that property, find out where the property is located, the opportunity, the financial spreadsheets, and everything. Join us on our investment property tour. The next one is Saturday, May 28th, uh, from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. 
there'll be a registration uh, link in the, in the show notes on YouTube, or it'll be in the chat coming momentarily. Join us. We're going to be looking at some uh, different properties every, every tour. So last property tour is really great. We had a lot of people out as usual. Sign up, get on these. They sell out uh, typically pretty fast. And uh, join us for May 28th, where we're going to be going through some Hamilton property, I believe. It really depends on what's available that week. And uh, so we're, we can't say exactly what we're going to be looking at, but I can assure you there are going to be some decent properties. You're going to get a chance to hang out with us. I mean, what more do you need? That's probably why you want to come anyway. Just come out and hang out with the team. We'll talk about stuff. It'll be great. Uh, we'll look at some property. And uh, as always, what we're watching for 2022 is we're watching interest rates, inventory levels, government policy, immigration, monetary policy, as that's what we get to in the show. So let's get right down to our first live deal. Who is first? I can go first. Bring it. My screen. <clears throat> so the property I wanted to present is a legal duplex in the central downtown um, neighborhood. Where is it? Right here. Um, it's a legal duplex. I'll share some pictures. Uh, it's located pretty central. Uh, close to LRT, close to James Street North. Um, uh, it's got a good lot size. Uh, it's kind of unique for a downtown property to have a, a deep lot like this. Um, and it also has a garage as well. That's kind of one of the main... Uh, here we go. Sorry, I'm just going to move this thing over. As you can see, uh, presentation we have here at the McCarroll team, we're moving real pros. fast, you know, like, you know, as I say, we go with a little bit of dead air time. We like to go contrary to the norms. <laughs> I've only been doing this for like three years almost, right? That's it. Yeah, no, yeah. So you're, you're practicing um, pro. Here's, here's the picture of the inside. Uh, it's not too bad, right? Like it's got some new flooring there. Could use some upgrades in the kitchen. I did factor in some renovations in there for you to kind of lift the lift the, um, the quality of the space a little bit. That way you can charge a little bit higher in terms of the rents. Um, so these are the, the current, so this is the second floor unit. Um, there's two units, it's a legal duplex. Um, main floor is a two bed plus like a den at the back. And then the second floor is another uh, two bed. The bedroom on the second level is a little bit smaller. Uh, but nevertheless, it's still a two bedroom unit. So rent, the rent will be slightly lower, but um, still two bedrooms. And this is a bonus two car garage that's at the back of the house. Um, for now, I've just included as part of uh, like a storage kind of rental. Um, but in the future, you could possibly turn that into a unit. It's a good size. Here you can kind of see how deep the lot is and that structure at the back. That's your two car garage. And it has parking too. Um, you can't really tell here, but there's actually two car parking behind the garage. Let me just back up here. So behind that, the lot actually goes even further back behind the garage and there's two car parking at the very back. I don't know if you can see my cursor. Um, and then it's got laneway access through here, uh, another access through there, another one from here. It's like an intersection back there. Um, so you have access from all different ways. Uh, so it'll be fairly easy to get parking and potentially another unit down in, in, in that garage. Uh, but in this calculation, I'm just factoring in as storage because, you know, the laneway houses are so new to the city. So it might take you some time to kind of get that figured out. Uh, obviously, the numbers would work a lot better if you have that as turned into a unit. There will be some costs associated with that. But that's something you can figure out down the road. Um, for now, we're going to focus on just this being a legal duplex and some storage in the garage. Uh, they're asking price slightly higher. It's been on the market for, I believe, about 14 days. So I think we can get, I spoke to the agent too, uh, we can get the price down a little bit uh, and it'll be vacant. Um, so you'll get a legal duplex vacant possession. 720 is what I figure the purchase price could be. Um, I did factor in a little bit of renovations, uh, you know, cosmetic on the inside and then some exterior work as well. As you can see, the house is yellow. I'm sure if you don't like that color, you might want to paint it. Um, so there's some work there, right? Um, not necessarily a, a ton of work where you're trying to like force depreciation and trying to refinance and pull it out. It's more so just updating it so you don't have a lot of maintenance over the years. 
and also you can get higher rents. I have 3,700 for the two units inside the house uh, and then the garage at 300, so totaling to 4,000 per month. Breakdown of your utilities, uh, it is separately metered, so you can uh, charge, uh, you can have the tenants pay their own hydro. It has a slot for a third meter as well. Um, the agent said that used to be for the garage, um, so you can always add that in and the garage would have their own hydrometer as well. Um, breakdown of the cost, property management, um, insurance, um, repairs and maintenance, 5%. And once I jump over to this side for the cash flow analysis, I'm using 3.25 because the rates are going to blow up. And 25-year amortization, th sorry, 30-year amortization, you're looking at a positive cash flow of $507. Uh -huh. That's what you're... Yeah, um, and then your initial investment, which would be your down payment, closing costs, and this 70K, um, you're around 233K. And based on that cap that much capital, here's a breakdown of your ROI. Cash return of um, 2.61, 4.86 mortgage pay down, and then appreciation of 6% annually. Um, you're looking at a total ROI of 25%. So good cash flow, even with the higher interest rate, uh, and that's just with the garage being a storage unit. If you turn that into an apartment, which would cost a lot more money, but the cash flow would significantly go up. So there's some future potential there. If you're interested in this one, hit us up. As I mentioned, legal duplex, completely vacant, and then potential for you know a third unit long term down the road. Where's the third unit going? Would that be in the gar like in the back in the garage? Yeah. Yeah. So it's a possibility for a garden suite. I think these are called laneway houses. Garden suites are more the ones that are, right. um, you know what I mean? Sure, sure. Okay, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, right, yo. Okay, cool. Um, nice. If you got any questions about that, uh, sold at McCarroll team is the place to reach out to uh, via email and uh, we can get more details on that one. That looks like a good one. Nice numbers yeah. on it. Um, not, no, lot, not a, not a burr possibility. I mean, if, one, you, really. if you did do the, if you did do the garden suit, then I would do the burr, right? Like I would refight afterwards. Mm -hmm. uh, but initially I don't think you're going to, like, if you spend a lot more, obviously you can improve the value and then uh -huh. refinance. But at that point, when you refinance, I don't think the rental income would be enough to carry that new mortgage, especially yeah. at a 3.25 percentage rate. Right, right, right. Very cool. Very cool. All right. Thanks. Do we want to go to property number two? I think yeah, we sure. All right. Let's go. All right. Um, okay. So <clears throat> can you see my screen? We can. Mm -hmm. Great. So I'd like to present um, a buy, renovate, refinance, rent, investment opportunity, also known as the famous Burr strategy. Um, so this property is currently existing as a non-conforming duplex. And uh, the opportunity here is to convert that into a legal duplex so you can refinance and, and pull out equity. Uh, the benefit to this property is the renovation costs are low. So you have many options when the refinance comes about. Um, so let's get into it. I'm just gonna show you some pictures. This is the main floor. Um, well, first, actually, this property is located on the West Hamilton Mountain, um, a really nice neighborhood. We're seeing a lot of conversions on this style property. Um, this one just hit the market and it's not holding offers. So if you have interest, please let us know and we can take you on a private viewing. Um, so this property is about 11, just over 1100 square feet above grade. And um, the unit configuration for the conversion would be three beds up and three beds down, uh, which is possible with really minimum effort uh, as a, opposed to having to create a new layout because the layouts are already essentially in place. Um, so the home's in really nice shape inside it's as you can kind of see from the pictures on the main floor it's freshly painted new flooring stainless steel appliances um and the primary bedroom you'll just see down here it's uh it's been opened up so they took two bedrooms and opened it up to create one really big one um but you could easily close this off again and have three units up on the main floor um, and then here's the basement so this was the separate entrance it's already in place. Uh, the height's about seven two down here. Um, wow. Lots, yeah, lots of uh, natural light. Um, but there's definitely, I mean, you see some wood paneling. There's some easy ways to um, 
add uh, to this, you know, the basement down here, you can redo the kitchen, oh. the bathroom. Obviously you're going to have to take out the ceiling and, um, you know, some requirements for the city to make it a legal duplex. But, you know, those main components that we're looking for, the height, the windows, um, out front, you'll see uh, two parking spots already exist as well. The, the lot is about 50 feet wide. So I don't think you're going to need any variances here uh, in order to convert it. And this space, I, I think you could do a little bit of reconfiguration and this is where you could potentially make a third bedroom. Um, there's a hot tub. So for anyone who wants one, <laughs> let's go let's leave it for the tenants. So, um, okay. So let's get into numbers. Um, which I think is up here. Okay, so it's currently listed at 699,900. And like I mentioned, the agent is holding offers. Um, the, the property that I presented last week that was a bit similar, but had a double garage ended up selling for 890. Um, much bigger lot, way, way deeper lot too. Um, and so with that being said, just to you know put into con some context for those who are watching every week, I definitely feel this one, you'd be, uh, potentially be able to secure it at 825. I've put in about five months of carrying costs. I think that actually might be less. Again, I don't think you need any variances for this property. Um, and the reason that I like this property, again, is that your renovation costs are going to be quite low um, because there's already, you're, you know, the units are already configured. So I've put renovation costs at 90,000, uh, you know, after construction insurance and appliances, potentially about 100,000. And your expected refinance value I have at 1.15. Um, you know, it doesn't have a garage, so we just want to keep that in mind. Um, and again, this is a conservative number. So today I've actually ran numbers at 75%, 25%. So I know we generally like to leave in 20% in, in the property, but I put 75 for or 25 for two reasons. One, even at leaving 25% in the property you're pulling out a lot of cash and you're only leaving in about 80,000 and you're cash flowing. Um, but more importantly, you know, it, this is the cash flow that um, it's getting more difficult with the interest rate hike. So on your refinance, I put your interest rate at 3.7%. Um, and if you're willing to leave in, you know, a little bit of money, then this is how we can make cash flow work with, um, increasing interest rate hike. So we just want to be really realistic with the current market and what's happening. Um, and this is something you, to keep in mind as an investor, you can adjust how much money you want to leave in or take out. You don't need to fully, you know, capitalize on the refinance depending on your goals and your strategy. So um, the rents I have uh, for the first floor, which is three beds, I have 2550. And for the basement, I have, I can't see, but 20, 2250. Now, if you increase this interest rate to 4% um, and say you even just get an extra 50 bucks on either of these rents, then you're still cash flowing. So just trying to keep in mind interest rate. So this is something that, you know, on a buyer consult, we can chat about and run through numbers and play with these numbers and figure out what works best for, you know, the investor. So, um, yeah, I think it's a, it's a great cool. Uh, excited. It's, it's, a, it's a great property. So if anyone wants to go see it, please let me know and I'll take you on a private viewing. Um, considering the last property sold at 890, what was the expectation on that one last week? Did we, what yeah. were you thinking? Was I that kind of I, in line with, with where you were thinking it was going to go for, or what was your kind of, how, did it go for more or, or less or? Yeah. So my purchase price I included in my spreadsheet was 910 and it sold for 890. Mm. So, um, pretty close. No cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what was the ask on that? I think it was six ninety nine two. two. So, oh, okay. So it was like a offer strategy. It actually sold the day after, uh, there was a preemptive bully offer. And by the end of the day, because they decided to entertain it, there were, I think about 10 more offers. So they went into competition on a preemptive offer. Wow. Multis. Yeah, bringing the multis out, the uh, the market's still producing, eh? I think that was still a really nice kind of property yeah. too, right? Like it had uh, the nice big lot, two car garage. That was a nice house. Mm. Interesting. Very cool. Um, yeah, that looks like a decent. That looks like a really good one. Uh, I like the ceiling height a lot. Um, numbers and uh, there's a good only like eight, you know leaving eighty grand in is at the twenty five percent. Uh, with a lot of equity i mean right you know so 80 grand of your own money you're but you're and you're still and you're got like an extra 25 
percent of equity in your property. So it looks like a really good one. Um, I mean, they're all good. We're all, all these deals were, I don't want to be biased here, but I like that. One. That one looks really good. Um, all right. Thanks for sharing. If you've got any questions about that or want to get in and take a look at that, or, you know, we offer consults to talk about your plans and your goals and how real estate investing can fit into it. Uh, or if you're thinking about moving into one of these properties and using it as a, uh, per, you know, home with some rental income, uh, those are some, uh, great ways. House hacking is how something I did all my life, um, before I got old or, uh, <laughs> anyway, so, um, Anyway, uh, let's just keep trucking here. Let's bring um, the next round of the show. We're going to go into um, some of the markets update here. So let me just shift my screen so I can do this. Uh, sold and McCarroll team is where you want to go if you have any questions about uh, either of those properties. You've got a couple more. So if those don't fit your criteria or your goals, hang tight. So we got two more coming uh, and we're going to get into those in a minute. So here comes the market update coming at you. Uh, sponsored by the McCarroll team, where we sell real estate. Uh, so uh, <laughs> just having fun here, guys. Trying to keep it light, you know? Um, okay, so here we go. Market update. So here's what's going on. So I just want to take a look at the Toronto area uh, for a minute here. Uh, single family home sales. Uh, full disclosure, I got this info from Ben Rabadou. He's a, a real estate um, analyst. Uh, that I subscribe to. His stuff's great. Uh, he's got a lot of great information. Ben Rabadou, uh, if you want to check him out, he's he's a really worthwhile guy to follow on uh, Twitter. Anyway, so just thanks, Ben, for this stuff. Um, single family home sales in Toronto. You can see the, the here's what's happening, right? So we want to get a kind of a pulse of the market. Where are things going in Toronto, right? Where are things going in the big metropolitans in Canada, you know, we're 45 minutes outside of that, you know, our, our market is sweet, but we look at it everywhere. We look at all over the, all over Canada because we want to know what is happening generally in the marketplace. We're even going to look in the U S we're going to look all globally. I mean, this is, you know, money moves, right? Money moves according to market conditions. And uh, we're going through a contracting period right now. If you haven't noticed uh, not only in real estate, but in the financial markets as well in equities, uh, in the crypto markets, uh, there's a real contraction happening. And, um, you know, for after two years, two and a half years from COVID money printing and, and, and credit opening the pipes, things are starting to contract. Um, interest rates are on the rise. This is the, it's, 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 it's pretty shocking how much of a, a, a correction or a slowdown that we're seeing, you know, SMP is down, um, 20% the last I looked. The, the NASDAQ, which is all the tech stuff, is down 30%. This is from the highs of, of November, December. Um, you know, real estate, we're going to take a look at that in a second. Uh, we you know we around Ontario, we've seen a slowdown of about price, price de, you know, declines of about 10 to 15%, depending on where you're located in the GTA, Hamilton, Southern Ontario area. Um, and that's since February. So that we've seen about a 4%, 5% decline February to March, March to April. Some areas are doing a little better. Some areas are doing a little worse. Um, but this is all buyer activity, right? Backing off. Um, and then, you know, and then the crypto market, you've, you've got just a, you know, actually some, some destruction happening there. So it's really interesting what's going on in there. That's a very fast liquid market. The stock market is, you know, kind of the historical place that is, that is definitely correcting. Um, and so we'll see what's coming. And a lot of the financial guys I talk to are like, oh, um, you know, this is probably getting close. Uh, hopefully there's no more pain. This is probably getting close to a bottom. I personally think that there's another episode coming, uh, that there's something out there in the financial markets or the credit markets that's going to break uh, due to the increase in, in, in rates and the uh, inability of, of many areas of the world like Europe and Japan and, and the, you know, it's the private debt levels being very high and the impact that this is having the squeeze and how tight things are and how over levered the world is in terms of, uh, you know, the money flow. So it's interesting to look at, um, you know, I, you know, the, the, the stock market is a forward looking mechanism. So it's looking ahead all the time. The real estate market is a bit of a, it's a lag. Um, you're you're going to see things move a, little, a lot slower in the real estate market. So the, the financial markets have, you know, all the rates priced in. So what we see now is, is, is a reaction to what they think is coming, what the, what the kind of the market believes is coming. But what, what I think that 
they're not pricing in is a, is a, is a, is a, is a snap in the credit markets or a, something going off in the world that we haven't seen yet. Um, meaning like a, uh, you know, maybe Europe has a, a crisis or Japan, which is really close to a crisis has something shocking go down, you know, where some record breaking thing that occurs that creates a ripple effect throughout the world. And then when that happens, there's going to be even a bigger step down. So that's my base case for the year is, is that there's a, there's an event occur, a going to occur, some sort of financial event, and that's going to bring things down even more in terms of the financial markets. And it's going to put a lot of stress on central banks and governments. And, you know, we're in election year in the U.S., and there's nothing that uh, a U.S. president hates more than go, going into the midterms with, uh, with a recession on the way. So, you know, a little macro commentary here. Um, I think that the, my base case for the year is that there's going to be a drop in um, uh, something. Something's going to hit the market. Shit's going to hit the fan, let's say. And the central banks are going to respond by lowering rates, and they're going to go into a money printing scenario. And this is probably going to occur. My, you know, from the people that I follow and and the the work, the research that that they do, looking into you know compiling a few different perspectives, Q3 2022 is when maybe you'll start to see rates go the other way. So the rates will start to actually come down. This is a bit. You know, definitely not. The media is not carrying this kind of perspective. These are this perspectives come from macroeconomic views. The people that that I follow that are really smart, smarter than me, um, they collect the facts. I kind of put them together and look at the patterns. And how does this all affect real estate? And that's kind of the big question that we have on the show: is what does this all mean for real estate? Well, you know, when equity markets are going down uh, and people are feeling less rich, they tend to spend less. So I think we're going to go through a bit of a period of of future more pain in the market. So I think that sales will probably continue to, to be low. Um, so if you look at the two black, uh, the, the dots on this black line there, that's this year. So you can see sales have really, you know, this is historically when sales start to go down, but it's, it's happening a little earlier, right? And it's, it's a little, it's pretty darn steep. So we're seeing a very steep decline in, in, in home sale numbers. Um, Moving on to condo sales, you can see an even steeper decline in condo sales in Toronto. So, you know, um, it's, it started off the year really, really strong, like record level sales in condos and residential homes. It's come off quite quickly. Um, you can see every year here, going back to 2013, how these lines, they're a lot more uh, horizontal, you know, so you see kind of like, you know, but we're seeing a real sharp shift in the market. And that's the sales. So we go to single family inventory. So the number of uh, uh, homes available for sale in, in the greater Toronto area uh, continuing to rise. And by no means is it like record breaking levels of inventory, though. If you look at it, it's really kind of in the middle. It's almost more like a, you know, a normalized market, if you will, in terms of the number of inventory. So that's going to continue to rise uh, if sales keep coming off, which, you know, the number of sales, we're in a balanced territory. We're not in buyer's market yet. Uh, so we've come away from this incredibly hot, frothy market. And we're now moving into more of a normal, historically normal uh, market. And that's really not a bad thing. Uh, the question is, how far is it going to go? So condo inventory is, is increasing quite, quite a lot. Um, historically so it's, it's getting up there and, uh, there is some risks kind of showing up in the condo market, uh, in terms of the num the cash flow numbers on, on condos in Toronto is reaching kind of the headline number cash flow is getting like, um, it is getting a neg uh, what is it? Negative. Yeah. It's getting negative now. Uh, so if based on the rent, the rents are strong, so rents are going up. There's a lot of demand for rents. We're seeing multiple offers on rents in the in the condo market. So you know a lot of people competing for rental because they're maybe stepping away from buying homes, and condos are looking more and more like a uh, a risk, a much a riskier uh, buy, especially pre con. Um, so they're getting negative in cash flow, and the inventory is going up. And even if you uh, they're just breaking even, if you include mortgage pay down. So if you include the mortgage pay down, they're, they're really looking like it's only an appreciation mortgage pay down play. Whereas before, you know, there was, there was that cash flow component. However, rents are, there's a lot of pressure on rents uh, in Toronto. Uh, 
buyer activity backing away from home buying, some of them, and they're going into the rental market. And so the, the, the good news for the condo market is that the rents are, there's upper pressure on the rent. So that's, I don't think I have a graph. There's a really good graph um, that I could share later that shows how much they're really at historic highs. The rents have really, really, really uh, taken up the slack that was, that was occurring before over 2020. They really dipped down really during the COVID days. Um, 2020 and 2021 and they've really really recovered and come back so good news from the rental stock but it's getting tight with the interest rates right being where they are moving over to hamilton um this is hamilton specific this does not include uh burlington so this is just the hamilton proper area and you can see the green lines the number of listings the red lines the number of sales this is like the you know the uh cardiogram this is like a doctor's uh, starting to feel like, a, you know, we're looking at a patient, you know, how's the patient doing? Uh, let's see. Oh, the spread between the sale, new listings and the sales is, is getting wider. That means more inventory is going to be sticking on the market. So the wider that, that green line and the red line get the spread between those two, uh, the more inventory that's going to be on the market month after month after month. So homes are going to be selling for less because there's just not as much buyer demand that's starting to come off. Uh, it's, it's still decent. And what happens to pricing when, um, when, when, when the demand comes off and the listings stay on, when you have sales to new listings ratio going down, so a sales to new listing ratio of 60% or higher is a seller's market. Sales to new listing ratio of 40 to 50% is a balanced market below 40%. You're getting into buyer's market territory. So in the Toronto area, you're, we're, we're, we're approaching buyer's territory right now. And this graph here shows the year-over-year -year prices, okay? And it shows the sales to new listings ratio in blue. And, and what, what happens is that the house prices track the sales to new listings ratio pretty good, pretty closely. And this is going back all the way to 07. And every time the sales to new listing ratio gets below um, that, it gets again to that 40% range, we're getting into buyer's territory. And, it's, and that's where we're heading right now. And so you can see what happens to prices every time that blue line dips below, um, the, like it starts approaching the 40%. You can see prices start coming, following down below as they start getting the negatives, right? And we're already starting to see that. So this is no surprise. Um, how far we're going to see this dip. Well, look what happened in 08. We, we saw a 5%. Um, this is year over year prices, you know, the, um, so that the declines happen, you know, this, this could equal more than 5% every year. Of course, those are, you know, you know, you're looking at year over year every month tracking that. So we might, we're going to see some declines coming in prices. So, you know, unless, uh, we see just a temper, we, you know, we'll see how far this, these prices are set to fall. Prices are doing pretty darn well, um, obviously, year over year, um, just with the run up in prices that we've seen, uh, you know, all 2021. And so we're starting to take off some of that high blow off the top froth that we saw in January, February. We're starting to be on the decline, but so prices are going to still show strong. Um, let's just kind of do a walk around the lake, shall we? Uh, Toronto prices are up 14% year over year. And what I find really interesting is the difference between the new listings and the homes sold. You're at about 60% there, 33,000 versus 4,700 4, new listings. So, you know, we're, we're in that balanced territory and approaching that buyer's market. Um, here is the uh, Pickering up 12%, Whitby up 21%, Oshawa is up 21%. A uh, little tighter market out there. Uh, homes sold versus new listings. So there's a, there's a little more buyer activity, you know, lower price markets. Um, Brampton, Mississauga, Brampton up 24%. Mississauga is up 14%. And uh, generally home prices are up 19% over 2021 in that area. Less than, a little less sale activity happening there than in, uh, uh, or a little more than in Toronto. Looking at Milton, Burlington, Oakville, generally up 11%. You can see the, the variations between the three markets there. And sales are really down, right? Like we're really, you, you can see um, the number of sales versus the number of new listings there. We're looking at like, um, you know, we're, we're, 
we're well, we're under 50% there. We're really approaching that 40% range there. So we could expect to see maybe price declining in the, in the suburban markets there, Burlington, Oakville, uh, Milton, maybe a little more pronounced than in the, the, the GTA proper. We shall see. Uh, Flambro, Ancaster, Flambro's uh, up 26%, Dundas 9%, Ancaster's up 13% year over year. You know, look at the number of sales. They're not a ton, 215, right? Home sales. So we're in the, approaching that 50% range, um, just a little over. So again, if we get under that 50%, go to the 40%, prices start to come down even more. So here's the Hamilton downtown area, Mountain, West Hamilton, East Hamilton, uh, you know, West Hamilton up 28% year over year. And we're approaching that 50% range as well in the down in the Hamilton Central. Hamilton Central, Hamilton East, Hamilton Mountain, Hamilton West. And not seeing this price declines uh, year over year yet. Stony Creek up 23%, uh, sorry, 24%, Glenbrook 22%, Grimsby 25%. And a uh, little pretty tight market again, around that 50% range sales to listings and uh, market. Uh, and Saint, so St. Catherine's up 14, Niagara Falls 19%, Welland is up 30%, Port Coburn's only up 5%. Again, 50%, we're approaching that 50%. So it's really across the board here. We're seeing this sales to new listings coming in around that 50% on average across the entire Southern Ontario market here. Um, though at least the ones that we focus on. Brantford up 10%. Ha look at the new listings to sales there. There's a, there's a lot more sales happening in Brantford. It's, a, it's just not a lot of inventory. There's enough buoyancy in the sales market to really keep that um, sales to new listing ratio higher. So we're probably at, uh, I don't know what the, my math isn't too good on that number. Who could do that real quick? I don't know. Is that 60% roughly? Feels like it. I would say 63%. Is that, is that right? Roughly speaking, 100 divided by 153, 103 divided by 153. Anyway, somebody bang that off for me if you don't mind. Yeah, it's in the 60s for sure. 60s, yep. yep. All right, cool. Well, that's, that's it's 68. So that's pretty, pretty high, right? Brantford's still pretty strong um, you know, from a sales point of view. Maybe it's the, you know, I mean, I don't, it's the average price is 800,000 Brantford. Look at the average price in Hamilton and it's, that's like the average price in Hamilton. The average price in Hamilton Center, West, East Hamilton Mountain is 809. You know, Brantford just went bananas. It just went bonkers. Like it was, it was a it was such an affordable market, right? Before. Like it was used like to be. 200, <laughs> to be. 200 grand below Hamilton average yeah. prices. And now it's uh it's just gone haywire. Or it's gone haywire. We'll see how these these markets perform over the next little while. Um yeah, so base case interest rates are going to they're going to throw in a couple more interest rates, maybe get 5 point sorry, 50 basis points in, 75 basis points in. Something's going to break out there, mark my words. Uh we'll see what happens in the next 2-3 months. Something's going to break out there in the in the in the uh in the financial markets or the credit markets. And it's going to be an interesting year. They're going to reverse course. Real estate is on sale compared to February, January of this year. And it's going to continue to be, I think maybe we see a 2018 leveling. So a little bit more declining, but if you find a property that works, I feel like this is, these are great. This, this is, these are the times you're never going to be able to time the bottom. It's really, really hard. Um, and I can say that once the QE comes again, meaning when they start printing money and, and, and bailing out something, uh, that that's when asset prices will start, could start ripping again. And, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not a, a, an advocate of the system. I don't believe it's the right way that we operate. I'm just reading the signs of the way the system operates. Um, you know, we're the financial world that we live in is in a, is a very, um, it's, 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 a, it's not operating well. It's a sick world uh, in terms of the finance, the way the, sick, the financial market works. And I know that might offend some people who are, purists and, and study the, the financial world, but I, I think it's broken substantially. And I think you got to learn to navigate it and to, to, to set yourself up to not uh, be in a rough spot and, and to really be defensive and to take uh, advantages when they're there and to, to be defensive when the opportunity, when the, when the need be. Um, and that's kind of the, you know, 
I think the when the bank um, bailed out the uh, sorry when the governments bailed out in 08. Okay, let, 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 let me posit something here uh, that I've been researching. Back in 08, when we had the financial crisis, um, it was a, a real estate triggered event with a bank bank triggered. It was really a credit issue. It was a bank triggered event due to subprime mortgages in the US. Uh, and what happened was that the governments printed money for the first time, QE, quantitative easing was the uh, first time I remember. They've probably done that in the past, but I remember hearing the huge QE that they did. And then what did they do? They bailed out the banks, right? With that money, the governments pumped money rescued the banking sector uh, and took, they basically, what they did was they socialized those private uh, losses. And, and that because the government takes on those losses, they're supported by the, the population. So that's socializing those losses. Okay, so the governments are now highly, highly debt indebted, right? And private sectors are, hi are highly indebted as well. The next crisis that occurs, financially speaking, and it is is going to be rescued not by the governments this time with their QE, but the, the central bank is now the ability has the ability to do this, and they're the only ones that can 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 rescue the system. So this this next event, whenever it occurs, is going to be a um, it could be a central bank bailout. So the central banks do the bailout to the governments, but that's the final one. <laughs> like, there's no other backstop with the central banks uh, uh, once they have once they've taken on those losses um then there's no other there's no nobody else that's going to step in so you know it's it's kind of like financial end times in a way there are ways to move through it you know there you know real estate is is always going to be a valuable asset we believe you know bitcoin uh gold uh there are going to be stocks that do well over the long run you know and these are things you need to think about, but you know, this is a real estate show. This is, we do focus on cash flowing real estate. People are going to always need a place to live when people can't buy homes, they rent. And what happens in every crisis is the rent, the rents go up uh, because people are not buying homes. They're renting. So the rental market gets tighter and tighter. Um, yeah. Anyway, that's, that's my long diatribe there or monologue. Let's put it that way. Um, any comments about that? Any, 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 anybody, any feedback on that or anybody have anything to say about that? Or there's a whole bunch of comments in the chat about that. <laughs> All right, let's get to them real, real quick. And then we'll get to the last, last couple live deals. Um, oh, there's a lot. Yep. Um, uh, <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot in there actually. Uh, great. Thanks guys. Let's get to um, maybe one quick okay let's get to them so wally's like for parking your down payment while you wait for the right real estate opportunity where do you guys store your cash with inflation as high as it is i added my real estate cash to my existing stocks portfolio for now but the dip keeps dipping <laughs> yes it does it hasn't turned out to be a wise decision in the short term but it shouldn't be a problem long term dca dollar cost average yeah i'm personally holding money in cash the i liquidated stocks back in january and I've been holding most of that money in, in cash and I do have more cash. Um, it, you know, I, I'm, I'm the U S dollar is, is, is going, is, there's a lot of upward pressure on it right now because a lot of people are leaving, um, leaving, uh, you know, the markets right now. So I would, I, I think short-term cash is going to be a good thing to be able to jump on, um, uh, opportunities as they show up, uh, personally. Um, do, 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 do. Uh, Simon or um, Gustavo, sorry about that. Simon, we were having some problems with the closed captionings. Um, Gustavo, is it possible to get the charts you're showing? Yeah, I could uh, fire those off. Uh, they're going to be on Instagram in a minute, but I could, uh, if you send me an email, Gustavo, okay, Mc, or sold at mccarrollteam.com, we can get you. Uh, uh, I'm assuming you're talking about the maps, I think, the map uh, percentages. Uh, Harry. I notice all the listings are presented from Hamilton or only is it due to cash flow? Uh, is it due to cash flow is not possible or any particular other reason? What do you guys think? You know, who wants to take that one on? Um, we spend a lot of time in Hamilton where, you know, I mean, we do work quite a bit in other markets as well, but um, there's still a lot of opportunities in Hamilton. I feel like with the price drop um, from a buyer perspective, there's actually quite a few, but yeah, you can make, I mean, we've run numbers in Brand. We do stuff in Brantford. We do stuff in St. Catharines, Niagara, um, all kinds of surrounding areas. 
generally we don't do a lot in Toronto. I know it's tougher to make things cash flow in mm-hmm. Toronto. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's just because we spend a lot of time in Hamilton as realtors. Um, so we can find, you know, basically deals in our backyard, so to speak. Yeah, the cash flow is decent there. Or I'll let you chomp on that in a second. Um, like there is numbers that you can still find it. And I think the, the 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 diversification of the employment in Hamilton, the transportation changes that are occurring, um, the big factors that are have historically moved markets, i.e. GO station, transportation, GDP, uh, you know, lots of uh, jobs in terms of public sector jobs. There's about 50% of the employment in Hamilton is public sector, hospital or uh, uh, university and healthcare. Um, you know, these are all the things that point to Hamilton and they've always historically been the reason why we've invested in Hamilton and they're going to continue to be. Uh, it's an, it, you know, versus Toronto, the affordability is still there, 800,000 versus 1.4. If you go all the way from Toronto, Mississauga, Oakville, Burlington, you're in the 1.3, 1.4 million dollar range. As soon as, and even Flamborough and Caster, same thing. Once you get into the Hamilton Center, Mountain West, East area, you're going, you're getting down to 800,000. So you know the, the the ability to make those numbers work and and the proximity to uh, tr- the big cities and the green belt compressing all of these areas still makes this a very good option i think for the long term viability for uh, for investing that's why we like hamilton in our rental market too yeah lots of tenants yep Arrow, did you want to say anything about that yeah we basically covered most of it um you know the job thing that you talked about it's very diverse um it's not like uh, centered around one type of it used to be at one point right it was just steel. Yeah. um it's not like that anymore so i think that's really good and yeah. it, Hamilton has the infrastructure, right? Like it has the infrastructure for a big city. Uh, a lot of the smaller you know, cities, they don't ha- really have that. So I kind of like that about Hamilton because it could support a big population because it did at one point. Um, and over time, obviously things happen, people kind of left. Um, so it has the infrastructure to support a big population. And I think that even the communities are so diverse, right? You go to downtown, it's a completely different feel than when you're up on the mountain. Mm-hmm. right you go to Ancaster it's a completely different feel than when you're at Stony Creek so it's like you have so many different communities it allows families and people that are looking to grow and like grow, start a family this is a good kind of area to kind of start uh, and that's not even looking at it from an investment standpoint right that's just strictly right. like you know affordability and you know people's ability to live and grow in places where they're happy right like and Hamilton has the lake you got the mountain you got forests like you got like Lots of things to do here. Whereas waterfall capital of the world. Yeah, like or I've Canada, lived in, maybe. You know, I've lived in other other cities too, and you know they just have a mall, right? You just go to the mall, and there's nothing else to do. The movie theater, right? In Hamilton, you got lots of things. To do. You still go to the mall, I know you. <laughs> still shop. Amazon, baby. Amazon. That's right. Um, question from uh, I don't know what your name is, but the question here is. Uh, SM. Uh, so from SM, do you think Bank of Canada might have to soft, be softer on interest rates? Yeah, I do. It's coming. Now, it won't look like it yet, but I think it's coming Q3 this year. Um, the, it'll follow the US. Like it'll be, it'll be, you know, it'll be what the US. It's like if equities keep coming off, if the market keeps, you know, once the, the, the impact of people's wealth effect decreasing has a huge impact on their, their future, you know, what their the consumer spending and the economy is 70% consumer spending in the North America, U S and Canada, same thing. So as equities drop, 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 um, you know, midterm elections factoring into that, like the urgency to get out of this and is going to be very high, get out of whatever might occur in the next month or two. If there's a, if there's something that breaks, it just tips things a little bit that didn't exist before they're going, I believe they're going to reverse course. I'm not the only one that thinks this, um, yeah, it's just, that's the base case. So yes, I do think that the bank Canada might have to be softer on interest rates at some point. I think they're getting them in while they can. That's my kind of thought on that. Um, Andrew Walsh, when you say 2018 leveling, you're referring to trends, right? As opposed to actual price levels. Yes. That's what I meant. I meant like the way the market behaved in 2018, there was a, it was a, it was a, it was a very balanced market t- trending towards a buyer's market. 
in 2018 and we had really just stayed like horizontal price growth. Like it was just kind of up and down across the horizon. That's kind of what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about going back to 2018 prices. That would be, <clears throat> that would be shocking. It would be shocking to everybody. They would be, they'd be turning interest rates around like tonight. If, if that, <laughs> they would be, if the, if the market was to go back to 2018 levels, you'd be talking like, God, I don't even know what, what that would be like 60% drop perhaps to get back there. I, roughly speaking, uh, I'm not, I'm not hundred percent sure on that, but to look at the graph, I can't remember how hot, what the price levels were at back then, but yeah, that would be, that would be shocking. The, the spillover effect from the real estate industry, not producing growth would be massive because of all the jobs associated with the real estate industry, construction, realtors, mortgage brokers, all of this, this is equal to 10% of the economy, sorry, 25% of the economy is, is real estate related, which is crazy. So you can very well, damn well anticipate that they're going to try to not allow that to happen. Um, SM, I believe the market reacted faster, harder than Bank of Canada thought. Yeah, the Bank of Canada was super late to the party because things were already correcting. And then the Bank of Canada comes in, which is just, they have PhD level, they have like 400 PhDs on staff at the Bank of Canada. The Fed has like a thousand PhD level staff. And these guys continuously mess things up because I think the problem is, is the way they look at economic models is broken. The, bro the models themselves don't really work with reality because we live in a money printed world uh, and money printing makes price signals distorted and it's coming to an end that distortion. Um, meaning th th it's not working the way it has for the last 80 years. Uh, so things are, are getting a little out of hand but they're going to continue to print. They're going to keep it as live as long as possible. Um, Gustavo, how would you calculate or determine the potential rental value based on the purchase price? Is there any formula despite the rental market comparison, any percentage maybe? Uh, anyone want to grab that? We just we're, we <laughs> work in the industry and we pay attention to rents, really. Someone yeah, has so, a better answer. So how would you, how would you was, go ahead, Matt? Sorry. I think that was more focused on uh, like, you know, a cap rate conversion of where you're trying to qualify the rents against a purchase price. Mm -hmm. That's how I kind of determined it. In which case, whatever your median rent is, you're going to multiply that by 12, then probably take, you know, 40, 50% of that away and then come up with an NOI based on that for like rough, you know, napkin math, we'll call it, mm. and then uh, divide that by your purchase price to get an estimated cap rate. Um, I think you'd have to do, you know, a good amount of these to kind of figure out where that micro market's cap rate is. Um, and if you compare it to cap rates at large, I think it'd be kind of a misleading measure. But uh, if you are interested in figuring that out, then that would be kind of the way to go about it. Okay. How would you calculate or determine the potential rental value based on the purchase price? I mean, so as an, as an offhand, cap rate back from purchase price. Yeah. As an offhand, as well. we, I've always used like, you know, like five and a half, like five, five to 6% somewhere in that range. So I'll take yeah. the, the monthly rents uh, of a property and I'll, I'll times it by 12. There's a couple of ways to do this. You times it by 12. So you get the annual gross rents, divide that by the purchase price. Um, and it should give you like, uh, uh, it'll give you a number like 0 0.055 or 0 0.05 or 0 0.06. So I was looking for somewhere in that five to 5.5 5 range, roughly speaking, should your know, numbers should be pretty decent. Like they, they could work. Um, then you want to go down to the next level analysis where you're actually building up the cap rate, getting in the actual expenses, you know, and that that's how you sort of to, to, to keep things moving in your life rather than spending all the time analyzing every single property to it to the 10th degree, um, you have a little, I use like a five and a half, it's called a gross rent multiplier. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. G GRM. Um, so you could Google that gross rent multiplier if you're, if you're stuck on that a little bit or uh, feel free to reach out to us, sold in the Carol team um, Okay, oh, you answered that question sort of there. Uh, um, SN, SM. I keep wanting to say S and I'm sorry. Uh, S <laughs> uh, 
I'm just gonna call you S and M. Okay. So S and M, uh, increase rent, increase investor confidence, increase prices and repeat. I believe interest and sentiments drive the cycle faster or slower. Yeah, I agree with you. And, and we have a very short memory as, as, as human beings, it seems it takes about three, four, five months for us to kind of move on past like, Oh, that's been enough time at that price level. Let's go on to something else now. Like, I've seen it time and time again. Uh, and I think you're right. I think the sentiments are huge. Uh, Antonio, here we're coming in with the heavy hitter, Antonio, with the macroeconomics. My man, Antonio, China's mishandling of COVID is going to ensure significant supply chain constraints well into Q4, compounded by events in Ukraine. Not sure we'll see significant inflation relief until the end of Q3, Q4. Unless there's a collapse somewhere, this will unwind more slowly than we think. Yes, I would, uh, I would tend to agree. It's, it could be a long, slow, just step down, uh, you know, pain after pain after pain. And we'll see if something breaks and then they got to pump some money into the system and then how that could turn things around. And, you know, not saying that's a great thing, but I'm saying that that's, I'm, that's like my base case. Um, would you have a numerical sample, please, uh, from Gustavo? Um, yeah, maybe just send us an email, Gustavo. We'll, we'll break it down for you. I could do a little quick, little short little audio for you. We're running out of time here. Sorry. Um, as an I'm sorry, this was here and I attended your webinar. It's regular. My wife used my left house and used the initials. Haha. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no problem. Um, okay, why don't we get to the next live deals, guys? Any, unless there's any comments before we move to them. What do you think? Ready to go? All right, fire away. Who's next? Um, I'll, uh, I'll go if that's all right, Adam. Yep, go for it. Save the best for last. <laughs> All right, so uh, today I'm presenting a buy and hold opportunity. It's located in the Strathcona neighborhood. So it's like, you know, about a five minute walk to Dundurn Castle. So towards uh, actually one of our Hamilton hotspots, uh, which is pretty great as well. So this property was uh, last sold in 2021 actually know the seller directly. So it's listed at 649. The seller is extremely motivated. So when they purchased this last year, it was fully renovated by the previous owner um, who was a contractor and did all the work himself. Um, we had the property inspected. Um, it's a beautiful little two bedroom bungalow uh, built in the 1890s, no foundational issues. Newer windows, um, all within the last five years, furnace, uh, AC, hot water tank are all owned and all new within the last five years as well. So it's really just a buy it and put a tenant into it immediately. Um, so the thing I loved about this one is that due to the area, the rents are outrageously high compared to some other areas of Hamilton. Um, so this would be a gross rent for a two bedroom bungalow of $29.50 a month, um, which is quite a lot. And to qualify this, I just want to bring this up. Sorry, guys, bear with me. Technology, you know, all the fun stuff. Uh, there we go. So this was a recent uh, lease. Uh, it's a one plus one. It is in Kirkendale, so it's still relatively close, geographically speaking. It's about two kilometers south. Um, same level of amenities as well. It was leased uh, March 15th for $29.50 after being on market for 11 days. Uh, mm. So pretty great. So with this, um, the because the seller is extremely motivated, um, I know there is a kind of minimum that they're willing to accept and they're looking to depart with the property as quickly as possible. Um, so with that in mind, it's listed at 649. I have pretty strong confidence that we'd be able to get it for 600, which is pretty great considering most of the homes that have recently been sold in that area are around the 725 mark. So we're calculating 8% appreciation for this. Um, so over the next decade, that gets you to just at the $1.1 million mark. So this property also has dezoning, and there is a potential to infill further down the line. Um, it's a bit of a weird concept to do this infill. I think the best thing to do would be to scrape the roof, put shipping containers on top of it, and have a front and back porch where it's cantilevered over the home, and then have posts supporting that uh, 
second story. So I'm working with the city to verify if that's a practical application. Um, and I've reached out to a couple uh, container property um, builders that work with containers. Pardon me. That's the right way of saying it. Well, fancy. Um, to see if this would be a practical application. Because at that purchase price, it would be a good long-term burr. So with this in mind, you're going to have a net operating income of $21.76 a month. Uh, this is assuming 8% management and 4% for repairs. Um, and as I said, it's newly renovated. You're probably not going to be spending uh, any money on repairs in the first year. And since it's a single family, uh, you could probably self-manage. It'd be a little bit easier. So with that in mind, with all the expenses, uh, we're still positive at $87 a month. With taking away the vacancy repairs and management, we're at $441 a month. Uh, which is pretty great for a just a small little buy and hold property itself. So go back through a couple more photos here um, just to give you a better view of the interior. So front living room, kind of a centralized living dining combo uh, with the kitchen being an addition from 2018 onto the back of the original home. Um, and then through this door on the right is the bathroom with uh, laundry. Unfortunately, it does not have a basement, 1890s. They didn't really believe in having full basements. So it's a crawl space, it's accessible through this uh, pantry door on the left side of the screen. Um, and that's where your furnace and your hot water tank are stored. Um, but yeah, I think there's a lot of potential with this one. And due to the motivation of the seller, I think it's, uh, you know, time of Time is of the essence with this one. You got to move fast to snap it up. And uh, it's only been on market for two days now. Hmm. Nice. Seems like a nice place. And if you think you're buying a condo for that price, and this one you're going to get like a Pretty much. two bedroom house with land and backyard and developable air rights, as they say, you can build up above you, do what you want with it. And... Yep. So it's dezoning. So you can get to two units um, and it's a maximum height of 46 feet. So Mm. kind of spoiled for height allowance and your air rights like you said you could turn that container ship on its side almost and, or it's added yeah. even and I'm yeah. just kidding. build like really tall no, some no. just do but, something a little strange i think a flat roof is probably what you're gonna end up with here that's cool. um but like yeah kind of interesting concept so very cool uh question on that one actually regarding the bungalow from jc regarding the bungalow that expects rent of 29.50 a month are there more examples to support this rent the example home looks much better than this property what do you think, yeah what do you so think the about? example home was actually a duplex uh so that was the main floor unit of that duplex so main floor right. and basement and there was still someone living above you so with that in mind this is a full home there's no issue in terms of privacy. I know mm -hmm. some tenants, when they're looking at renting at that price, do have concerns with that, where they're like, well, I just don't want anyone in my way. I want the backyard mm -hmm. to myself. I have, you know, this has two car parking, which is a uh, uh, little atypical for homes in this area. Normally they're one car or uh, just on the street um, with a permit. So it would mm -hmm. be uh, the right way to go. Is tenant going uh, to stay at 2,900 a month or vacant possession upon purchase? It is vacant possession, so it's currently owner occupied. Uh, she, the owner, was actually um, just letting friends and family stay in the property. Uh, got overwhelmed with the prospect of having a tenant go in there, and is motivated to sell. Hmm. And was, um, and sorry, what neighborhood is it in? Is it so? This is a... Strathcona, so Strathcona, it's just off okay. the Dundurn corridor, close to Dundurn yeah. Castle. Yeah, it's it's a great spot. Yeah, really good area. A great rate of appreciation as well. Um, so 8% is actually pretty conservative. I pulled the numbers from the last uh, decade of sales in that neighborhood. Um, and over the last decade, it's averaged about 13% year over year. Mm -hmm. And that's for two to three bedroom homes with one to one and a half bathrooms in a two kilometer radius of this property. There you go. If you wanted specifics. <laughs> you got them. <laughs> All right. That's awesome. I love it. Uh, that's a good one. A really good one. Adam. You All right. It, you want to take it away? Yeah. Uh, I have a listing of ours. Yay. Um, so I've analyzed this a couple different ways. I know 
um, kind of like Matt did. It's always good to look at other opportunities that you can do with your property. Um, so this is a single family bungalow. It's um, right here behind Center Mall. It's an okay area. It's uh, it's it, maybe not the best, but it's not the worst. It's it's okay. But again, the prices are reflected in that in terms of what the buy price. So we have it listed right now at five twenty nine. Um, it's about 800 square feet. It's two bedrooms up. Um, so I've analyzed it actually two different ways. I've analyzed it strictly as a buy and hold single family. Uh, it will just break even, which is great. Um, so there's a couple of different strategies here that uh, we'd look at, uh, but we'll just go through the picture. So all the major components are actually in really good shape. The roof, the furnace, they've got a brand new on-demand water heater that's owned. Um, but in terms of the interior, it's pretty dated. Um, not gonna, not gonna lie. Uh, but one owner for the last 20 plus years, um, I know for, if any of you have been on the webinar before, you know, I always like these homes because they're, they're dated. So you're not paying a lot for any renovates and renovations that have been done recently, but they're usually very well cared for. And this is definitely one of those homes, um, as you can see from the lovely flooring, but, uh, it's in good shape. They were in the middle of painting when we did take these pictures, unfortunately, um, so you could upgrade the kitchen. It is a neat in kitchen. There's a nice big living room. Sorry. And then there's uh, two bedrooms that are both quite a good size off of there. There's the uh, master and there's the second bedroom. They both have closets and the bathroom, which it's in, it's in decent shape. Now the basement height is fantastic for these uh, houses in this area. Sometimes that can be a little challenging. There's a rear entrance that can easily be blockable. There is already a, another uh, a, another bedroom down here. Um, you know they've done some uh, some insulation on the walls. Be pretty easy to block that up. That's the back porch, and the entrance is actually just to the right here to get into the basement. Um, the other value add here is there's an alleyway behind this garage. The 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 lot's actually really deep, and there is a, a use a, like a, a, a currently being used alleyway. So there's a parking pad out front, and it would be very easy to get parking out back. That will come into play with the second analysis that I've done uh, that I will show you. And it's right across the road from a park, actually, which is kind of nice. So as a single family home, um, you know, you, in that area, I did it at about twenty three fifty. Um, again, I would probably maybe do some floor upgrades, a little bit of paint um, just to make it look a little bit nicer, maybe ten, fifteen thousand dollars. Rent it out as is. You'd probably want to put maybe a bedroom door on the, you couldn't tell from there, but there's already a compartmentalized bedroom down there. Um, so it is a three bed essentially. Uh, so once all your expenses, again, electricity and there is no water heater fee, the property taxes in that area are really low, which is also a really a big bonus. Usually they're about $3,500. In other areas, you're not going to be paying gas. I did put a little bit of a repair contingency fund on here. And I did do my loan amount at 3.75 because I wanted to make sure that it was going to cash flow at a higher interest rate um, for future value. And as you can see, it breaks even. If you have no repairs, you're going to be about 100 bucks a month. So that's kind of the baseline that we like to analyze properties on. We never really recommend for our clients to get into a place, even if they can afford it, where they are putting a couple hundred bucks in. Um, pretty simple reason for that. Let's say the roof goes or the furnace goes, um, or some major component goes, that $200 that was easy for you to afford, now if you have to do that repair, maybe put it on a line of credit, now you have another $300 on top of the 200, sometimes that can get tight for people. I know some agents, um, especially when they're you know advising their clients to maybe buy a condo, um, they say, well, if you can afford an extra three or 400 bucks a month, then it's a good deal because future value will mean that you will get the appreciation. It's a risk, um, you know. If if it's a risk you're willing to take, so be it. But just from in terms of how we advise our clients, we like to see things at the very less, at the very least, cash flow neutral. Which this one is again. If you don't have repairs, you're doing well. So I also took a look at this one from a duplexing perspective because when you get into something like this, there's a couple different ways to look at it. One is you buy it as is, rent it out single family. And your future value, you know, in five years at 6%, which is really low, um, you have four, over 40K mortgage pay down and you have over 325 equity. 
the option here is buy it and duplex it right away. Or if, you know, if you, this is, this is something I talk with clients a lot about is maybe you get a renter in for two or three years, maybe after two or three years, they're ready to move on. Now you have some equity in that property. Now maybe is the time to think, well, maybe I can duplex it. So I ran numbers as a duplex, just at current, you know, my, what, what's going on with the market now, you know, you're buying for 525, say, um, I did put quite a bit of renovation in. It is a smaller house, so it might not be 150. But uh, again, we like to kind of overestimate a little bit on rental costs, underestimate a little bit on rents, just so we have a bit of a built-in buffer when we're looking at these properties. So a refinance value of 800, which is pretty low for a legal duplex, even in that area. Um, but again, I want it to be quite conservative. So if you do all that work, you make it into a legal duplex. Uh, rents I've set at 1900 for the first floor because it would be a two bed. And in the basement, you can definitely make it into a two bed down there. It's, it's, it's surprising. There's a steel beam in there too. So there's a ton of, uh, of ceiling height in there. So conservatively, 1900 and 1600, you'd be getting 3500 in rents total. And you would be looking at pulling out 220 of your initial capital and only leaving 65K in. Now it would be cash flow negative, a little bit. Again, these rents are pretty conservative. I did throw management in there, so if you self-manage, you'll be positive by about eighty bucks. If you do get another hundred bucks here and a hundred bucks here, you'd be breaking even, and I think those rents would be very doable in that area. Um, and again, just to take it one step further, if you decided to do something that you know Tabitha was talking about, maybe you leave a little bit more money in the property, and these are all considerations. So maybe twenty five percent loan to value, you're still pulling out. You're only leaving a hundred k in, and now you're just about breaking even with with management. Again, self managed, you're going to be you're going to be almost three hundred bucks positive. And again, if you get just a couple hundred bucks more in the rents, you're you're in the red. So or sorry, in the black. So this is one of those opportunities where it works as a single family. It works as a duplex. Maybe you don't want to duplex it right away. Maybe you want to do a buy and hold for a bit. And then when you have the equity, um, do it down the road. So there's a lot of opportunity with this property, uh, I think. And again, the, with this refi value, I feel like that's a little low. The rents are a little low. Um, you can probably get into this with a little less renovation. Um, but that's uh, that's what I've got. Cool question uh, from uh, our favorite S and um, What percent delta do we see in the refinance value if we convert this into a duplex versus keeping it single family house? So, what's the difference in, in price that we're going to see on the you know on the on the back end on the on the end of this project? So if you were to keep it a single family five years, it's worth this. If you make it a du <clears throat> make it a duplex five years, it's worth this. Do you, do you have something like that? Like yep. a um, so, I mean, five years, what you're looking at, uh, hold on, I'll just share again. Cause I, I we have the, uh, the appreciation formula in there. And as, so, long as, the, as long as you're using the same appreciation numbers. Yeah. Uh, it's easy enough for me to switch cause it all auto populates. Oops. That should not have happened. So yeah, like I said, mortgage pay down, you're at about a 42 K uh, equity and property as a single family after five years, again, 6% is low. Uh, you're at 325. And as a conversion, in five years, you've got 60K pay down and you've got over 500K um, in, a, in equity as well. Again, depending on your ARV, depending on a lot of those numbers, but uh, mm -hmm. not quite double. I'd say it's about 60, another 60% on top, uh, not for the mortgage pay down, but for the equity. Wait, no, that's not right. 30%. There we go. 175,000 is the yeah. math I had in my head there. Yeah. 175,000 difference between the, um, yeah. And then question yeah. there. Thanks. Also, will lender give more refi value if it's a legal duplex? Yep. Yeah, for Absolutely. sure. Absolutely. And it will get, get you more on resale when you, if you decide to sell the property for sure. And it lessens your risk of, you know, um, if you decide just to put an in-law suite in, which a lot of people do, it definitely less, lessens your risk, um, in terms of tenanting and neighbors. Delta percentage in general, uh, from a single to a duplex, same property, difference between the two. Um, uh, what would it be roughly? We got Just doing it. Take right on that. Now. 
325 divided by 530. Talking about 61%. Is that right? No, it's the other way around. 30. So it would be 30, about 38%. 39, 38%. Yeah. That's the difference in this case. Yeah. In this case, it is a case by case for sure. Yeah. It is case by case, but that sounds about right. I mean, that feels about right. Mm -hmm. I mean, we'd have to analyze a few of them to kind of give you a a bit more accurate number on that, but that's about right. My opinion. Question for Gustavo. um, When you add up the money pulled out plus the money left in the property, aren't you getting aren't you getting the amount you invested? Yeah. That's what I was going to ask too. Isn't this, isn't the du- the duplex could be a burr. So that's going to, that's going to skew your, we were just looking at this from a, like a after repair value. Here's the sale price versus the sale price of a single family versus the sale price of a duplex converted. Right. But if you do a burr, that's going to, then your returns are going to go all through the roof because you're getting, you're getting into a project for less money. So though we were, it's definitely going to throw, it's definitely going to be a higher ROI to do a burr than it is to, to, to hold it as a single family because you get to get your money back. It's forced, you get to forced go, depreciation, right? That's then you get the to whole go, point. You get to go do stuff with it. Yep. Like buy Bitcoin if you're smart <laughs> or go to Costa Rica if you're having fun. Either are. One's a better For investment example. than the other. For example. For example. I mean, I wouldn't, I don't know who's thinking about that, but... <laughs> Okay, guys. Um, anything else to wrap up here, or anything else? Any comments, queries, questions, ideas? Um, you know, share. I think there's Anyone a lot got- of opportunities out there. I think. I think you know. Yeah. I, I'm I'm kind of excited about in terms of investing that uh, with this market shift. I think there's a there's a ton of opportunities coming on the market for sure. So a burr, Harry S, is a buy, renovate, rent, and refinance, and repeat. Mm-hmm. If you if you're feel so inclined, so B R R R R Burr. That's what we call it. We call it the Burr. I don't. We didn't invent it. It's just. It used to be just called like equity appreciate. Like buy and renovate a property and then maybe refinance it. That's what we used to call. It. But then fancy real estate people came up with the acronym, and it stuck. And there it is. All right. Um. Why don't we just probably a good place to wrap? I don't know. Kind of feels a little weak, but let's uh. Let's just wrap it because we're kind of running out of time. Oh, more questions. This is how they keep us on the line. How would you qualify a potential tenant to avoid late rents? Uh, How would you qualify a potential tenant to avoid late rents? Uh, Credit check. uh, Landlord references are the big one. Employment references. You got to check these things when you're getting a tenant in. We have a leasing manager on our team, by the way, who does all this for you if you're interested. That's what she does. So the, the whole thing about qualifying a tenant is... You want to check your landlord, previous their previous landlord, sorry. So you call them up and you have a conversation with them and you say, hey, how's your tenant? And, you know, it's a great way to find sellers, by the way. Uh, calling up um, your ten- <clears throat> tenant's landlords. If you're looking for opportunities, it's a great way to find people who might be w- willing to sell their properties. Good lead generating source too, as well. Just saying, if you want to find some leads for uh, properties, you can call up, a, you, you know, call up landlords, say, Hey, I'm qualifying it. I wouldn't do this for, I wouldn't be insincere about it, but um, yeah. So that's, that's a big one. Um, so you want to call the previous landlords and you want to find out how they were as tenants. And then you want to call their employer. So you qualify all this stuff, right? And then you do it a ratio of, they got to be able to afford 40% of the rent has to come in at about 40% or under plus their other obligations. So the rent plus their other liabilities has to come in under 40% of their income. That's, that's kind of, you don't want them higher than that. So you got to factor in their, you know, payments that they're making on their car, or their payments they're making on any debts. And then there you take their rent and add that up. And that should come in at under 40%. Uh, you're finding that a lot of people are getting up in that 40% range or more these days because debt, just because debt, there you go. You're welcome. Um, okay, guys, why don't we high five? And uh, <laughs> what a team, what a team. They all high five. All right, guys, well, we're going to wrap it up uh, until next week. Uh, it's a uh, good time to get out there. The weather's amazing. Enjoy. Keep it positive. Tabitha's got videos going on all about this, about keeping it positive. Um, and uh, yeah, I can't stop talking. So I'm just going to say happy investing. Goodbye. See ya.